So with that said, um, many of you here probably know Mark Twain, you know Huck Finn, um, Adventures of Tom Sawyer, that's kind of uh, where his, his, his permanence in the American kind of consciousness exists, or even international consciousness. Um, my story um, about Twain is really uh, younger Twain, he was a journalist, um, that's how he, he uh, got into uh, book writing. And uh, Twain was born in Missouri in November 30th, 1835. Um, his father passed away when he was 12 years old. And so in order uh, to make money, he actually joined the uh, local newspaper. And uh, with that said, I'm going to mention that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who many know, came to Washington in 1832. He made some interesting observations about Washington. Now, one thing about um, Paris is, I mean, the, this history going back here, centuries, more than centuries, uh, Washington was planned as the capital of the United States before it was really a city. It, would not have, it not, did not really mature into a city until really after the Civil War. And Twain, um, when he was 17 years old, he had a disagreement with his brother and actually left uh, Missouri and ran away and, and came to Washington. But I'm giving this little um, observation that de Tocqueville made about, um, about America. Let's read this. Um, Outside of the rugged new capital of Washington, American institutions and culture in the rest of the country have been progressing since colonial times and were more fully formed. One of de Tocqueville's larger observations of the country was that of the culture and profession of journalism. He wrote, quote, in America there is scarcely a hamlet which is not its own newspaper. It may readily be imagined that neither discipline nor unity of design can be communicated to so to so multifarious a host, and each one is consequently, consequently led to fight under his own standard. All the political journals of the United States are, are arrayed indeed on the side of the administration or against it, but they attack and defend in a thousand different ways. So in this environment, Mark Twain was able to be creative as a journalist. Um, he really kind of stretched the truth, and um, we later see that in his writing. But as I mentioned, he came to Washington um, before the Civil War, came in February of 1854. And he tried to catch uh, a ride on the omnibus. And this is what he, he wrote in February of 1854. Then, if you should be seized with the desire to go to the capital or somewhere else, you may stand in a puddle of water with the snow driving in your face for 15 minutes or more before an omnibus rolls lazily by. And when one does come, 10 to 1, there are 19 passengers inside and 14 outside. And while the driver casts on you a look of commiseration, you have the inexpressible satisfaction of knowing that you closely resemble a very moist dish rag. And feel so too. At the same time that you are unable to discover what benefit you have derived from your 15 minutes soaking, and so driving your fists into the inmost recesses of your breeches pockets, you stride away in despair with this step and grimace that will make the future of a tragedy actor, while your ordinary appearance is greeted with screams of laughter from a pack of vagabond boys over the way. Such is life, and such is Washington. <laughs> um, so Twain um, is in New Orleans when the Civil War breaks out. Uh, his brother, Orion, gets an appointment uh, to serve as the Secretary of the Nevada Territory. He actually did not have money uh, to take the trip, um, so his, his younger brother, Samuel Clemens, actually lent him the money. He goes out to Nevada. Nevada um, was, at that time, working its way uh, to become a state. And, um, Twain, after kind of failures being a pocket miner, joined um, the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise and covered the Nevada um, State Convention while they, were, while they were in the process of becoming a state, which they did in, uh, right before the election of 1864. Um, Twain uh, then was given the opportunity to travel um, to Europe in uh, the summer of 1867. This is right before he arrives in Washington in November of 1867. And um, because of where we are, I figure I would uh, read a couple of Twain's observations on Paris that are in Innocence Abroad, so deviating a little bit from the script. Um, so this is what uh, Twain wrote on Paris. This is um, pre, uh, this is 1867. In France, all is clockwork, all is order. They make no mistakes. Every third man wears a uniform, and whether he be marshal of the empire and, or a brakeman, he is ready and perfectly willing to answer all of your questions with tireless politeness, ready to tell you which car to take, and ready to go and put you into it to make sure that you shall not go astray. Now, I've been to Paris many times and ridden the metro, but I hadn't seen uh, the people in the orange vests that actually stand uh, just until the, the other night, so I thought that was very... Uh, relevant. Here's another observation that he made, or he's telling a story. 
We went out to a restaurant just after lamp lighting and ate a comfortable, satisfactory, lingering dinner. It was a pleasure to eat where everything was so tidy, the food so well cooked, the waiters so polite, and the coming and departing company so mustached, so frisky, so affable, so fearfully and wonderfully Frenchy. All right, and then, uh, and then, and then if I go throughout the distance abroad, I won't, I won't, uh, he, he actually writes um, at great length about, his, uh, about Paris, but uh, he talks about um, engaging a tour guide. And, um, at the hotel, the good guides, I guess, were out, so they had to kind of set, set, settle for one who um, wasn't the best. And so he's trying to uh, pitch his services, and this is how Twain uh, uh, dictated what, what the uh, tour guide said. Uh, if the gentlemen will make the grand honor to me to retain in his services, I shall show to him everything that is magnifique to look upon in the beautiful Paris. I speak the English parfaitement. <laughs> um, okay, so so I, I share that because right on the uh, the epilogue of, T of Twain um, taking this this travel uh, excursion, which was kind of like a carnival cruise of its day, uh, was very um, uh, it was a great opportunity for Twain to write about uh, Europe and um, even visited uh, North Africa. And he wrote for the New York uh, Tribune. And while he's in Italy, he receives a letter from William Stewart, who is senator from Nevada, inviting Twain to come to Washington to serve as his private secretary. Um, and that's how Twain arrives in Washington in uh, late November of 1867. Um, I will read some of the more humorous observations that Twain made about Washington. Are there any Washingtonians in the audience? Okay, so some people might, might know this. Okay. So, um, one of the things that Twain wrote about, um, what, what, Twain spent a third of his life overseas. He lived in many American cities, um, and kind of his formula was he would absorb the local culture, the local moorways, folkways, and then kind of uh, put his own little spin on it. So in Washington, I'll hold this book up. Right here is a real uh, news item that was in the Evening Star on 25th uh, of November. So this is about two days after Twain arrives in Washington. And it talks about how no cows uh, are allowed about the city hall and that um, people were fined for letting their cows kind of um, stray. And, and uh, it's really kind of humorous because in most cities, you don't have cows kind of wandering around. And so this is what Twain wrote. Uh, he wrote this in January uh, for the Daily Alta California, January 68th. On New Year's morning, while Mr. George Worley's first door, front door was standing open, a cow marched into the house. A cow that was out making her annual calls, I suppose, and before she was discovered had eaten up everything on the New Year's table in the parlor. <laughs> Mr. Worley was not acquainted with the cow, never saw her before, and is at a loss to account for the honor of her visit. What do you think of a town where cows make New Year's calls? It may be the correct thing, but it has not been so regarded in the circles in which I've been accustomed to move. Morals are at a low stage in Washington, beyond question. <laughs> All right, so another thing I'll say, too, is that uh, we uh, were talking with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, true art earlier, is that when Twain is in Washington, he is moonlighting um, as a private secretary. He's really there writing for a series of newspapers, the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, the Daily, Daily Alta California, some New York papers, the Chicago Republican, uh, etc. And um, he was also a private secretary for a senator. Now, today that would be, um, I mean, beyond question, you have the Senate <laughs> Ethics Committee. You couldn't have, like, George Stephanopoulos has his show on ABC, but then he's also the press secretary for um, President Obama. But in uh, when Twain was in Washington, that was kind of the, the way it worked. That's the way you worked the system. And many journalists that he lived with um, kind of told him, hey, this is how you milk Washington for as much as it's worth. Um, okay, another thing that I'll read is about the weather, about Washington weather. Um, I don't think you need to even have ever been to Washington to, to, to <laughs> find the humor of this. As politics go, so goes the weather. It trims to suit every phase of sentiment and is always ready. Today it is a Democrat, tomorrow a radical. The next day neither one thing nor the other. If a Johnson man goes over to the other side, it rains. If a radical deserts to the administration, it snows. If New York goes Democratic, it blows. Naturally enough, if Grant expresses an opinion between two whiffs of smoke, it spits a little sleep uneasily. If all is quiet on the Potomac of politics, one sees only the soft haze of Indian summer from the Capitol windows. If the president is quiet, the sun comes out. If he touches the tender gold market, it turns up cold and freezes out the speculators. If he hints at foreign troubles, it hails. If he threatens Congress, it thunders. If treason and impeachment are broached, lo, there is an earthquake. If you are posted on politics, you are posted on the weather. I cannot manage either. When I go out with an umbrella, the sun shines. If I go without it, it rains. If I have my overcoat with me, I'm bound to roast. If I haven't, I'm bound to freeze. Some people like Washington weather, I don't. Some people admire mixed weather. I prefer to take mine straight. <laughs> okay. Um, 
I will, I, I will slow down. I'm, I'm sorry I'm speaking too, too quickly. Let me read some. Uh, let me read here. So when Twain was in Washington, he, he was rooming with a, a, a number of journalists after Senator Stewart had kicked him out. Um, he was living with Senator Stewart at 14th and F Street, um, kind of right across the street from where the National Press Club is today. And he would sit up all night smoking uh, cigars in his bed, and he drank President, uh, excuse me, Senator Stewart's uh, alcohol. And so the, um, the landlady said to Stewart, "If you don't kick out uh, this young man, um, you're you're going to have to go because he's going to set the uh, bed sheets on fire, and I'm going to be without a house." So when Twain was kicked out by Senator Stewart, he spoke with his fellow Washington correspondents and was able to get a room. And uh, George Alfred Townsend, John Henry Riley, William Swinton, George Adams, many. Uh, names that have been forgotten, um, those were his roommates. And many years later, when Twain became famous because of his book writing, they looked back on a, uh, looked back with astonishment on, you know, how did this guy who was such a slob and he thought was going to amount to nothing, how did he become, you know, famous and I've been forgotten? So this is a this is an account that was in a newspaper in 1883. Um, uh, a journalist was looking back on his time uh, living with Twain. So this is how Twain kept his uh, kept his room. Twain's little drum stove was full of ashes running over on a zinc sheet, which was covered all over. The bed seemed to be unmade for a week. The slops had not been carried out for a fortnight. The room was sour with tobacco smoke. The floor, dirty enough to begin with, was littered with newspapers from which Twain had cut his letters. Then there were hundreds of pieces of torn manuscripts which had been written and then rejected by the author. A dozen pipes were about the apartment, on the washstand, on the mantel, on the writing table, on the chairs, everywhere that room could be found. And there was tobacco, and tobacco everywhere. One thing is that there were no flies. The smoke killed them. And I'm now, and I'm now surprised that it did not kill me too. Twain would not let a servant come into his room. He would strip down his, in his suspenders, his coat and vest, of course, being off, and walk back and forward in slippers in his little room and swear and smoke the whole day long. Of course, at times he would work, and when he did work, it was like a steam engine at full head. Okay, um, jumping around a little bit, but uh, going back to when he was serving as, um, as secretary for William Stewart, although Stewart kicked him out of his lodgings, he continued to, to, uh, to work for Stewart and the other senator from um, Nevada. And How old was he? I'm sorry? How old was he? How was he? That's a great question. Um, Twain actually turned um, 32 years old in Washington. Um, so he's still a young man in his early 30s at that time. Um, so Twain's job uh, as a private secretary was responding to constituents' letters, which as you can probably imagine, is uh, not, not a good, uh, bad, uh, bad assignment. Articles that uh, Twain wrote after he left Washington to kind of explain what got him fired. And he, um, he reproduced one of the, one of the letters, uh, that, that constituent letters that Twain responded to. So this is... Um, uh, coming from constituents in Nevada, um, and they're asking for uh, a post office because their town is growing. Uh, Dateline, Washington, November 24, 1867, Mr. Smith, Jones, and others. Gentlemen, what the mischief do you suppose you want with the post office at Baldwin's Ranch? It would not do you any good. If any letters came there, you couldn't read them, you know. <laughs> And besides, such letters as ought to pass through with the money in them, for other localities would not be likely to get through. You must perceive it once, and that would make trouble for us all. No, don't bother about a post office in your camp. I have your best interests at heart and feel that it would only be an ornamental folly. What you want is a nice jail, you know, a nice substantial jail and a free school. These will be a lasting benefit to you. These will make you really contented and happy. I will move in the matter at once. Very truly, Mark Twain for James W. Nye, U.S. Senator. So, uh, as you can imagine, when some of these uh, constituents receive these letters, they wrote very, very uh, uh, sharp uh, critiques back to the senators and said, you know, what is this? Is this a joke? You know, who, who, who do you have working for you? And um, so Twain was, was uh, quickly dismissed. <laughs> so some other some other things. So when Twain, when Twain is in Washington, he's he's known as uh, he's identified as a Californian. Um, he had uh, wrote letters uh, on the Sandwich Islands, which are now known as Hawaii. As Hawaii, he had not really started his um, career as a lecturer. Um, so he's still living in a certain level of anonymity. But he was he was popular <laughs> amongst his fellow journalists to be invited to speak at the Newspaper Correspondence Club banquet, and. Um, it's just, I think, a really interesting story. So, um, 
So they're, they're meeting on, on Pennsylvania Avenue, and they're having a, uh, a grand time, and uh, they, they encountered a little bit of a dilemma, which Twain um, featured in one of his uh, Washington uh, letters. At 12 midnight, it was announced from the chair that the Sabbath was come, and that a due regard for the Christian character of our country demanded that the festivities should now come to an abrupt termination. The regular toasts were not finished yet. The fun was at its zenith. Here was a scrape. How would you have gotten out of it? I will tell you how we managed it, and it will be worth your while to lay the information away for private use hereafter. <laughs> it was gravely moved, and is gravely seconded and carried, that we do now discontinue the use of Washington time and adopt the time of San Francisco. <laughs> and then we bowled along as serenely as ever. We gained about three hours and a half by the operation. How was that for ingenuity? It was easy sailing after that. When we had used up all the San Francisco time and got to crowding Sunday again, we took another vote and adopted Hong Kong time. I suppose it would have been going west yet if the champagne had not given out. Um, okay, let me... Uh, so, so those are some of the funny stories. Um, like I mentioned earlier, William Swinton was a journalist that, uh, that Twain uh, shared time with as a in his lodgings in Washington. William Swinton is uh, very well known, um, or was known in his day as actually the author of school textbooks, but um, oh, Swinton is such an interesting character. If anyone is, uh, has a real intimate knowledge of uh, General Grant's memoirs, which Twain actually had a hand in publishing, Grant actually devotes uh, time to William Swinton, and he does that because William Swinton was a journalist at the, the New York Times, and he um, attached himself to the Army of the Potomac under the, um, the premise that he was a historian, he was going to write a history on the Army of the Potomac. Well, it was found out that he was a journalist, and actually during the Civil War is when um, bylines started to be um, uh, printed in newspapers because the generals would... Um, reach out to the editors and say, you know, who wrote this? Because basically they've jeopardized and compromised our position. You know, this is intel and information that we don't want in the papers. Um, so out of that, you had bylines. So William Swinton was identified as a journalist, and he was kicked out of kicked out of um, out of the camp and told to never come back. Well, um, just a couple weeks later, General Ambrose Burnside was meeting with the staff sergeants, and they see this guy kind of slinking behind a tree, and say, you know, go, well, who is that? And they, they kind of um, rough him up, grab by his collar and say, you know, who are you? And he said, well, William Swinton. He said, well, you know, you've been told not to hang around the camp and, uh, you know, we're going to have to execute you. So General Ambrose Burns had actually wanted to shoot and kill William Swinton on the spot and he sent uh, kind of um, uh, dispatch up to the headquarters asking for permission and General Grant said, you know, yeah, we might not want journalists in our camp, but we probably shouldn't be in the business of uh, killing and executing them. So this is kind of who William Swinton was, and he's roommates with Mark Twain, so you can just imagine um, the combination <laughs> of these two guys. Um, so, so this is uh, Twain recalling his, his time with Swinton in, in Washington. I had just come back from the Quaker City excursion and had made a contract with Bliss of Hartford to write The Innocents Abroad. I was out of money, and I went down to Washington to see if I could earn enough there to keep me in bread and butter while I should write the book. I came across William Swinton, and together we invented a scheme for our mutual sustenance. We became the fathers and originators of what is a common feature in the newspaper world now, the syndicate. We became the old, original, first newspaper syndicate on the planet. It was on a small scale, but that is usually with untrue new enterprises. We had 12 journals on our list. They were all weeklies, all obscure and poor, and all scattered far away among the back settlements. It was a proud thing for those little newspapers to have a Washington correspondent, and a fortunate thing for us that they felt in that, in that way about it. Each of the 12 took two letters a week for us at a dollar per letter. Each of us wrote one letter per week and sent off six duplicates of it to these benefactors, thus acquiring $24 a week to live on, which was all we needed in our cheap and humble quarters. <laughs> and so this is the time when, when Twain is still, um, he's not yet married to um, Olivia Langdon. He's kind of still enjoying his kind of last... Uh, uh, last days as a bohemian. Uh, he's still kind of um, writing to get $4 so he can go buy, buy his bottle of John Barleycorn. Um, and so he's later, his wife later kind of refined him and uh, he became kind of like a Victorian uh, gentleman of letters. But he was still kind of rough around the edges and uh, of dubious potential when he was in Washington. This is another um, little account of, of how uh, furiously he was writing. I have written 182 note, pa note paper pages of newspaper matter at a dollar a page and seven of magazine stuff at four dollars a page in the last two days. If I can write as much more in the next two days, I will be all right again. I just want to show them that when I make contracts, I'm willing to fill them and then 
I will throw up all my correspondence except $75 a week and sail in on my new in on my book because I've made a tip-top splendid contract with a great publishing house in Hartford for a 600 page volume illustrated about the size of a patent office report. My percentage is uh, a fifth more than they have ever paid any man but Horace Greeley. I, I get what amounts to just about the same. He was paid, but this is public this is a publisher's secret. Keep it to yourself. Okay. Um, so Twain actually leaves Washington um, in early March of 1868 while Andrew Johnson is being impeached. And that kind of really shows um, where Mark Twain's thinking was, that he was more determined to make his name as a novelist, as an author, than as a newspaper correspondent. Because, I mean, that was the story of, of, of the year, the story of the century, you know, the impeachment of uh, the president. And Twain said kind of, well, I'm not going to be able to make my fame, you know, with the rest of these guys, these, you know, journalists. You know, they can have, they can have um, as much fun as they like, but i got to get this book written. So he travels to San Francisco, negotiates um, the contract, um, with the, the editors of the San Francisco paper that had published many of his travel correspondence. And Innocence Abroad, which came out in 1869, was actually the most popular, highest selling book during Twain's lifetime. Um, like I said, we mostly identified Twain with um, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. Um, another little excerpt, which is uh, something I found kind of investigating this book, was there was, this, there was a bookstore that, that Twain frequently went to, and it was called The Old Curiosity Shop. And it was just on the foot of uh, the Capitol. It's now where um, the Museum of uh, Native uh, American Indian is. Um, so it's long since been uh, demolished. And the proprietor was a very cantankerous fellow who was interviewed um, many times over the year. He years. He ran a bookstore from 1867 until about 1912. And so when he was asked by um, journalists, well, you know, do you have any famous uh, customers? And he said, well, yeah, this Mark Twain fellow, he comes in, he, you know, he thinks he's really funny. But he's always trying to make jokes, and I kind of tell him, look, you know, if you're not going to buy a book, stop talking. <laughs> so anyway, um, so um, the bookstore, which, like I said, it was called The Old Curiosity Shop, was really famous in its day. Here's a print. This is from a 1902 book um, that kind of drew The Old Curiosity Shop. So if you can see, which I'll read a quick description of, uh, the books were scattered all over the place. So this is uh, in a 1902 book, a description of The Old Curiosity Shop, was, which was a store that Twain frequently went to. Leaving the Capitol grounds, the first thing to catch the eye is a quaint old second-hand bookstore on the right-hand side of the street, the proprietor of which stands in his case of volumes. I'm sorry. Let me just start again. Leaving the Capitol grounds, the first thing to catch the eye is a quaint old second-hand bookstore on the right-hand side of the street, the proprietor of which stands in his cave of volumes like a hibernating bear. Here you will often see statesmen stop on the way to the Capitol to examine some rare book, which has accidentally caught the eye, and then to bargain with the dealer for its possession. But if the volume in question should be found to possess any merit, rest assured it will not be secured without a payment fully equal to its value. For however unassuming the old book dealer may seem, he is quite adept in price listing his wares. So I mention that because if anyone has been in, in Washington recently, um, they've been to Eastern Market, which is a very popular uh, place in Washington, they might have come across Capitol Hill Books which is run by my good friend Jim Toole, which here's a, a photo you might not be able to see, but Jim also, um, his bookstore, the, the books are literally stacked from the floor to the ceiling, and he has all sorts of little jokes and notes um, throughout, uh, throughout the store, and he, like for example, Harry Potter, he put a little note that said, the secret, you know, the witch dies at the end, or he does all sorts of things like that. So I interviewed uh, Jim because he's very similar to the proprietor of the old curiosity shop, so I'll just, uh, Go ahead and read. This is a, a quote from Jim, which I think is pretty fun. Um, I was in the Navy 30 years, 26 days, and two hours, retired as a rear admiral. I was an American history major at UCLA. Since I knew I was going to the Navy, I thought I ought to know a lot about the country. Then, during Night Watch, I read up on what we were trying to do internationally and how I was influenced by history. I eventually received a master's in international relations from American University. I'm, I have been reading nonfiction for 60 years. They don't teach that shit anymore. Instead, they teach American studies. Kids nowadays know nothing about the history. It is blended with sociology and American studies. Breaking his stern demeanor, Tool says with a wry grin, I tell these kids who come into my shop saying, like this and like that, life is not a simile. I give away copies of the thesaurus for free. <laughs> um, then just to, to bookend um, Twain and Washington, a lot of times uh, we see him in, the, in a white suit. Um, he actually premieres uh, that white suit in December of 1906 at a copyright hearing at the Library of Congress. 
Um, if anyone here is a, kind of a scholar of copyright law, the current copyright law that we have in the United States, um, Mark Twain is actually someone who, who um, should be given due credit for influencing our modern copyright law. Um, and uh, so the story kind of goes that uh, he was the last person to testify that day. It was about four o'clock. He's in his black frock coat, and he's called, called you know, Mr. Mark Twain. He throws off this black frock coat. And, oh my gosh, what is he doing? He's upturning the convention of the seasons. He's wearing white in December. And so he got as much press for his white suit as actually what he said, and that was very calculated. Twain knew that uh, that would kind of emphasize his point. And um, I guess one of the last kind of closing humor stories. So after after his triumphant um, testimony at the Library of Congress, he goes over to the Willard Hotel, and um, so he's staying in the Willard Hotel, uh, and he takes the elevator down, and the elevator opens right into the dining room. And so no one really kind of looks up from the mirror, they just continue eating. And, and Twain is not satisfied with that, en uh, with that entrance. He says, the friend that he's with, he said, well, this is not going to do it. Let's go back upstairs and try this again. <laughs> so he goes back upstairs and uh, takes the stairs down and kind of walks down Peacock Alley um, and, and goes to the front of the dining room. And the doors kind of open and, so, and someone says, hey, that's Mark Twain from the Library of Congress. And they all get up and cheer him and they say, oh, you did a great job with the library today. And so uh, Twain was someone who definitely uh, liked public attention and he really thrived off that. And um, so that's like his white suit, uh, although you know it's not really told, that was his, he premiered that in Washington. So Twain had a lot of connections to Washington. Um, I appreciate you listening to me. I know I talked a little fast. Um, this is my first time ever giving an international book talk, so I'm a little, little, little nervous. But um, with that said, I think we have enough time for uh, a couple questions. Twain, um, the, Mark, the Mark Twain Project out of um, University of California, Berkeley, has a great online website that has digitized and annotated all of Twain's letters uh, that he sent to his family, publishers, journal, um, his uh, uh, journalist buddies. Um, the constituent letters, I don't know that any have actually ever shown up. The way we know about the constituent letters is because Twain wrote a piece kind of later saying this is what got me in trouble. Um, now whether or not these letters do exist, we really don't know. I mean, Twain, a lot of his, um, you know, so much is apocryphal with Twain. He really, he really stretches the truth. He'll take like a little, you know, just a small little uh, grain and, you know, blow it out into a, um, uh, and that's really, and I, I mentioned earlier, his is experimenting with journalism and kind of be, being given the creativity uh, or the creative license by his editors kind of allowed him to do that? Um, that is a great question. I would imagine if one of those letters showed up, it would be worth a lot of money. Um, hmm, the fact that they haven't probably indicates that they, they, they don't exist. Um, with that said, in terms of just kind of like the research in Twain, um, the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise frequently, their Twain's news items were republished in the San Francisco uh, Bulletin. And there's no extant um, bound volumes of the, of the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. So the only way scholars know what he wrote for that paper are stories that were, I guess I should have been speaking to the microphone all night. Um, but they, the San Francisco paper republished these letters. There was an item in the, a, a Dallas newspaper in 1906 where there's an old editor and he's actually saying why I sometimes look through these old bound volumes of the, San Francisco, of the Virginia City paper. And researchers are kind of speculating on whether that really exists. Um, Mark Twain's brother wrote an autobiography um, of his life, which mentioned, obviously, his brother uh, a lot. Um, Albert Bigelow Payne, who was Twain's kind of uh, self-appointed biographer, lost um, the manuscript in Times uh, uh, Grand Central Station. Was it Penn Station? Grand Central Station? Um, and that's another thing the scholars are like looking for. Hopefully it shows up one day at some auction. Um, new, new Twain letters and correspondence and ephemera and margin, you know, uh, all sorts of things are, are found frequently. Um, so maybe the, maybe in some attic in, you know, Nevada, there's a letter just waiting, waiting to hit uh, Sotheby's or something. My first book was on Frederick Douglass in Washington. Um, Frederick Douglass actually visited Paris in uh, 1886 and 1887. Um, he's one of the most famous American abolitionists or native sons. And uh, that, that, the book was very successful. The publisher um, kind of said, well, we'd like another book from you. You know, we don't care what it is, just something. That, you know, just, 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 I, I've been able to kind of market and promote the books very well and attend events like this and stuff like that. Even though I talked, talk very quickly, you know, I think, People like the subject matter. So um, I said, well, I know that Mark Twain was a journalist in Washington, and I'm, uh, 
through my kind of just little survey of the Mark Twain literature, I know that there's not, there hasn't been a single monograph written about his time in Washington. And uh, so they said, well, you know, run with it. And uh, in about 10 months, I was able to research and write the book. I mean, my daytime job is I work for the uh, DC Public Library. I work in the special collections department of um, our main branch around old map city directories. Um, and, uh, but I also write for a number of uh, online publications. I write for print papers. I, used to, I was a, a daily journalist for about nine months, and I mean, I'm still like a you know freelance moonlighting journalist. And so a, a lot of the things that Twain went through in Washington, I can definitely <laughs> identify with. And uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm not uh, like as humorous, so I don't kind of have the same wit that Mark Twain has. But there's just so many different. There's so many things that really stuck out to me, and it was really kind of a. Um, I, mean, I do some investigative uh, stories about how the, the DC government mishandles money and all sorts of things, but uh, this was in its only kind of a, a, a real process of investigation because um, I was able to like the things I've already shared with you tonight. Some of the things haven't really been published before. Um, uh, if anyone knows Washington very well, um, the Gap in Georgetown, um, Mark Twain actually gave a lecture there on February twenty second, eighteen sixty eight, and um, I actually reached out to kind of the uh, all the way up to the hierarchy of the gap, because a friend of mine, a fellow librarian, says that in 2018 we have to put a plaque there and there has to be a reenactment, a speech that the lecture that Twain gave. It's so, like I kind of reached out all the way through the gap uh, uh, hierarchy, and when I talk, spoke to the person who could kind of make that decision, they said, Well, of course, we don't know anything about you know Mark Twain speaking here. So there was some kind of some other things that I found, um, like Peacock Alley is kind of uh, it's unchanged or since the way it was when Twain walked through this kind of would say, well, Twain's spirit kind of haunts, you know, this uh, Peacock Alley. Um, but just uh, working as a journalist, I think in Washington is, is, is unique. I'm more of a local journalist. I don't cover Congress. Uh, a paper that I write for, I could get a, a Senate and House press pass, but that's not really my interest. I cover like local Washington, um, real local neighborhood politics. But I mean, still kind of working in Washington as a journalist, there's some, you know, universal, universality and things that you do. So um, that's really just kind of what, what uh, stood out to me. It's a great question. Uh, I, well, I traveled within Washington to the National Archives, the Library of Congress, some other libraries, but um, the, um, there's a couple different institutions. University of Virginia has some Twain letters. Um, there's some other repositories I was able to reach out just to online, and if I said, you know, I'm looking for this particular letter, they scanned or emailed me a copy or mailed a copy. Um, the folks at the Mark Twain Project out at, uh, out at Berkeley were extremely helpful. Um, I wasn't able to travel out there, but um, the letters that for the time period that I was looking for are all digitized online. If anyone is aware of what they've done, it's probably one of the most comprehensive um, scholarly processes for any sort of American man of letters. I mean, uh, if anyone knows, like, the research that's been done on Abraham Lincoln by the National Archives, where they've identified every single thing that uh, Lincoln wrote or even signed, um, I guess it's kind of comparable to what the Mark Twain Project has done. So you can literally go onto the Mark Twain, web, Mark Twain Project website to the, letter, the letters database and type in Washington, D.C., and it will give you, um, whether it's from Washington to Washington, who's the author, um, what years, um, you can, there's all sorts of ways you can kind of key, keyword search it, and these letters are also annotated. Now the, the Mark Twain letters for his Washington period were published in a book, and the Mark Twain Project, what they did is essentially put the material that was in the book online, because they kind of um, promote the universal study of Twain. So that was extremely helpful. I think if that didn't exist, I could, probably could not have written the book. Um, the digitization of newspapers really ha has helped the Chronicling America, which is run by the Library of Congress, um, my, my employer, we have the Evening Star and the Watch Evening Star digitized, which was the prominent paper during Twain's time. Um, so that kind of helped um, in terms of just the way research is now. If you know how to interface with Google Books and all these technologies, as Professor Neville well knows, um, it can really accelerate the research process. Um, so next book in seven months. I don't know about seven well, the, the thing I'm working on now is more of a kind of piece of immersion journalism. I've uh, spent a lot of time in the Anacostia neighborhood. Um, I've been a journalist there for about five years, and there's really interesting things happening in Washington. Uh, gentrification and all this sorts of change and stuff like that, but it really has not crossed the Anacostia River. Um, this neighborhood, Anacostia, was um, founded in 1854. 
And so there's a lot of interesting characters. Reverend Oliver O.J. Johnson is one of my main contacts in Anacostia. So the piece I'm doing now is kind of more um, of reporting um, on what's kind of going on, kind of contemporary urban affairs, I guess. Not, not so much of, you know, uh, something about a 19th century figure. When, 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 Twain is when Twain is 12 years old, his, his uh, father passes away, and he, he leaves his formal schooling and um, becomes what was, what was called a devil's, uh, devil's printer, kind of an apprentice um, at the local paper in Hannibal. And um, even at a young age, when like the editor would go out of town, he took editorial control of the paper. He would always get into feuds um, with people. And then he had a fall. And actually, his older brother, Orion, ran a newspaper. And one of... Um, Twain's beefs was that his brother never paid him what he said he was going to pay him. And so when he's 17 years old, Twain runs away um, from Hannibal and he goes to St. Louis, he goes to um, New York, goes to Philadelphia, and comes down to Washington. And he would send his travel dispatches to his brother's paper in Iowa. And so Orion republished um, these, these travel dispatches. So that's how we actually kind of know what, what Twain wrote about Washington um, prior to the Civil War. Then when he goes out to Nevada, in 1861, he first tried to, uh, if anyone's read Roughing It, which was published in 1870, which that's probably one of my favorite Twain books next to The Gilded Age. Roughing It is about his experiences traveling west and kind of becoming a journalist. But before he was a journalist, he tried to make a fortune as a miner. And he said, like, you know, one day he's a millionaire because of speculation. The next day he's dead broke. And he kind of tells the story about how uh, it was just, it was too risky for him to try, try, his, try his way as a miner. So he was... Um, writing, just writing kind of uh, letters under the name Joshua for the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. He then reached out to them formally and said, like, I'd like a job. And so they gave him a job in um, the fall of 1862 as their city editor or city reporter. The Mark Twain nom de plume appears in February of 1863. And um, that's how we've you know, kind of come to know, you know, I mean, I refer to Twain all the time, but his friends would call him Samuel, or his friends knew him as Sammy. Um, but that was kind of his, his public face, um, was whether lecturing or writing was, was Mark Twain. So he, when, he, when he arrived, in, like I mentioned earlier, um, Senator Stewart invited him to serve as his private secretary, knowing that Twain was going to write um, court, you know, Washington letters. And a lot of times, um, senators and congressmen would employ a journalist because it would kind of create a firewall against negative press. Not only in terms of that journalist writing favorable about whatever laws that they were doing or writing favorable profiles. But if you employed someone who's a journalist, they could tell you, hey, you know, this paper is doing an investigative story on you. I just wanted to let you know. Or, um, you know, if journalists were drinking or something, so, oh, yeah, I'm writing a piece about, you know, Senator Pomeroy. He's a real, you know, scumbag. And then, like, if someone worked for Senator Pomeroy's right there, you could say, oh, he's not so bad. And that, so that's kind of how it worked. I think, I think, I think there are some books. I'm just saying, if you'd like one, you'd like to sign up for it.